Amiable viewers, welcome to this week's edition of Science and Spirituality, the first in a two-part series. The origins, lifestyle, and knowledge of early civilizations can be understood through the amazing artifacts that have been unearthed in various parts of the world, which suggests that ancient humans knew much more than just the use of simple stone tools. Many legends speak of a time when gods, goddesses, giants, and visitors from the heavens walked the earth. Jason Martell from Los Angeles, USA has spent the last 15 years researching this topic through written records, artifacts, and other materials showing evidence of humankind's activities in the distant past. Mr. Martell is one of the world's leading researchers and lecturers on ancient but seemingly advanced technologies, as well as early civilizations' interactions with beings or extraterrestrials said to have descended from the skies. He is the author of Ancient Alien Artifacts, Visual History of Ancient Astronaut Research, and Knowledge Apocalypse, Ancient Astronauts, and the Search for Planet X. In addition, Mr. Martell has appeared on TV channels such as Discovery, Sci-Fi, and the History Channel. A lot of the artwork going back thousands of years to petroglyphs, various carvings, uh, wall reliefs, depict beings coming down from the heavens and interacting with ancient man. Now, modern academia looks at these and says it's mythology. It's man's way of trying to understand his place in the universe. But it seems like ancient man went to great lengths to convey a lot of this information by showing wall reliefs, drawings, and depictions of certain events where beings were coming down from the heavens, usually on some type of a craft. The Sumerians, uh, modern day Iraq, 6,000 years ago, Mesopotamia, Babylon, the original civilization there, Sumer, has a lot of interesting similarities with our modern Bible. The stories of Adam and Eve, Noah's Ark, giants upon the earth. All of this information is told in Sumerian epics that are recorded in stone and are still unchanged to this day. So I think that ancient man went to great lengths to convey a lot of the sacred information that today we struggle to understand as mythology. That word mythology is interesting. The Greek word comes from mythos, and mythos actually meant knowledge that's held to be true and sacred among kings and priests and passed down as sacred knowledge. Since the Sumerian epic, which is around 6,000 years ago, there have been various advanced cultures who have either had some type of influence by beings from the heavens or had access to some type of lost knowledge. Some of that would include being able to build monuments that are astronomically aligned to certain constellations. Um, as an example, one of the pyramids in South America is designed to represent this god, Kukul Khan, the serpent god in the form of a snake. The Sumerians are credited with having the world's first sophisticated writing system and a deep understanding of science, mathematics, and agricultural technology, along with a highly developed society ruled by priest kings. The cuneiform writings and pictorial evidence left behind by the Sumerians suggest that they did not develop their civilization on their own. In fact, they credit their advanced knowledge to ancient beings, the Anunnaki, who came from a planet located somewhere on the outskirts of our solar system. The very name Anunnaki translates as those who from the heavens came. Anunnaki is a term uh, given by the Sumerians for the beings that visited them. Just like in the Bible, it says there were once giants upon the earth. The Sumerians seem to be living in an epoch of time that the Bible is referencing, where they literally lived amongst their living gods called the Anunnaki. And the Anunnaki said that they came from not just heaven, but another planet within our own solar system. This planet they called Nibiru, stands for planet of the crossing. And this is a very interesting coincidence that 4,000 years before Jesus on the cross, the Sumerians depict the Anunnaki as coming from a glowing cross in the sky. The depiction of this planet was a glowing cross. So there's a lot of interesting religious overtones and similarities for how the Anunnaki and the Sumerians interacted and how that knowledge has been told over time in its now condensed form of biblical tales in the New Testament. What ultimately became of the Sumerians and Anunnaki? Mr. Martell's research has unearthed some possible answers. 
one of the interesting things of the Sumerian culture is to understand where did they actually go, what happened to them. And it seems very possible that as far-fetched as this might sound, there were ancient nuclear wars that took place in the Sinai Peninsula. And this is an area where we know that the Anunnaki and the Sumerians were setting up their civilization, at least from their accounts and the texts that they've left us. But modern science looks at the Sinai Peninsula and says, wow, we see evidence for uh, vitrification, glass, sand literally exposed to such a high heat that it's become vitrified, it's glass-like. When we show scientists this evidence, they say, oh, that looks like volcanic evidence uh, in that area. When we tell them there's no volcanoes in the Sinai Peninsula, they kind of shrug and say, well, then I don't know. So a lot of the stories clearly explain that the Anunnaki in their own squabbles between different family clans eventually had a nuclear war against each other and that was the reason they and pretty much left everything in turmoil. And it's an interesting piece that came out of that which is there was a time when the giants and man interacted and that's what all the Sumerian information speaks of about the Anunnaki. However, when they had this nuclear fallout, the Anunnaki leave and all the high priests who get all this sacred information directly from the gods build statues of the various gods and start to worship and idolize these statues, which is a tradition that we still carry on today. As modern day space technology and science evolved, astronomers began to speculate on the existence of a large heavenly body tugging at Neptune and Uranus, causing them to follow irregular paths as they travel along their orbits. This body has been given the name Nibiru or Planet X. The ancient Sumerians have a very detailed epic of creation story, similar to what we have in the Bible, where it says God created the heavens and earth in seven days. Well, that story is just a derivative from an ancient Sumerian version in stone, unchanged. As an example, it's one of these stories is called the Epic of Gilgamesh, and it explains in great detail how the Anunnaki originally came here to earth. And they give some groundwork on saying that Billions of years ago, when our planets were still soft, they weren't a solid mass, that this other planet, a rogue planet, got pulled in by the gravitational effect of some of our outer planets. This planet, Planet X, had a very primitive interaction with our solar system, and it changed it in very significant ways. Um, Uranus tilted on its side. Neptune and Pluto are possibly dislodged moons from Saturn. Even modern science can confirm to some degree the creation stories given to the Sumerians by the Anunnaki of how our civilizations came to be. This planet X got pulled into our solar system and continues to now have a very long 3600 year orbit. We only go around the sun once every 365 days. Nibiru goes around our sun once every 3600 years. So it's on a much longer scale of time, but it is actually a part of our own solar system. Some say that Nibiru will pass near Earth in 2012. So will Planet X or Nibiru have any physical, gravitational, or other effects on Earth when it passes by? Is there any connection between Planet X and the many predictions of the world undergoing a large-scale transformation in the year 2012? A lot of people speculate that there's some climactic event coming, Armageddon, the revelations, Wormwood, there's certain biblical overtones that have said at some point there will be a judgment day, God will return. That's not an easy thing to answer and a lot of people seeing the science of Nibiru, the ancient planet, and Planet X, the modern understanding, start to look at those connections and add new variables to say that must be 2012 and that the planet's coming back to kill us. I don't subscribe to any of those theories. The Mayan calendar is misinterpreted as saying that in 2012 it's the end of time. It's actually the end of a cycle of time. Everything repeats, just like in nature. Seasons come and go every year. The ancients were aware of a much larger cycle of time, this 24,000 year cycle. So a lot of people just misinterpret the Mayans or calendar and ending on a certain date. It's not ending, it's starting a new cycle. People wonder when's the next time Nibiru is going to pass by. Space is three-dimensional, and it's very possible that each time Nibiru passes the inner part of our solar system, Earth might be on one side of the sun 
and Nibiru could be completely on the other side as it's looping around. So it's possible that every time Nibiru completes its orbit through our inner solar system, it might not always cause havoc on Earth. The reason why I say that is it's just a simple mathematical calculation. Um, we know Nibiru's orbit is roughly 3,600 years to go around the sun once. We know that Nibiru originally entered our solar system roughly 4.7 billion years ago because the Sumerians explained when the planets were just becoming a solid mass, Nibiru got attracted and became a part of our solar system. So if we take 4.7 billion years, the time when it initially came into our solar system, and divide it by 3,600, which is how long it takes to go around once, Nibiru has already looped through our solar system over a million times. So maybe not every time it completes an orbit, it's going to have gravitational effects here on Earth. Mr. Martel's book, Ancient Alien Artifacts, contains images of complex artifacts and technologies seemingly lost and forgotten by Earth's historians. Fascinatingly, he has constructed working models of two ancient technological devices, one known as the Baghdad Battery and the other the Egyptian light bulb. These brilliant advanced artifacts show how early humans harnessed technology for practical purposes. Please join us again next Monday on Science and Spirituality for the conclusion of our interview with Jason Martell, when he will discuss these amazing technologies with us and other topics. For more information on Jason Martell, please visit www.xfacts.com. Books and DVDs by Mr. Martell are available at the same website. Thank you for your company on today's program. Coming up next is Words of Wisdom after Noteworthy News here on Supreme Master Television. May heaven's guiding light always be present on our planet. For more details, please visit www.suprememastertv.com forward slash SS. rethink our lifestyle, we have to rethink the whole planet, uh, species and survival, not just uh, for our enjoyment uh, day to day or momentarily, we have to think uh, very unselfishly. Just to be vegan is very simple, that saves all the lives on the planet, save the animals, save the environment and save the world for our children future. We are the children of heaven. If we want something, we have to show the sign that we want that. Okay, now if we want peace, we want uh, benevolence, we want love, blessing from heaven, we have to start showing that by action. We have to show love to each other. We have to be benevolent to each other. Uh, we have to uh, benevolent to all. Then heaven will say, ah, my children want that then that will come. But we cannot just sit and pray peace and peace and benevolence when our actions are in the opposite direction. This violence and killing of humans and animals are the sure sign that we don't want love, that we don't want compassion, that we don't want peace. It's the law of the universe that if we kill or if we harm something, we have to share our spiritual merit with that. So how many animals we eat, we share all our spiritual bank account with that animals, and then we are depleted. We get poorer and poorer spiritually, poorer. And if you don't have spiritual merit enough, then you have to pay with your health, your luck, or your family member um, peace. And then larger, we pay with peace in the world. We have to pay the price for having no peace. By killing animals to eat, we're killing our planet, and then we all become murderers. So I want everyone to become heroes, save the planet, stop eating the animals. If people turn to veganism this time, it's because to save the planet, that means to save lives, not only animals' lives, but 
the earth life and the humans' lives, you know, billions of us. In this case, their marriage is immense. So even if they don't study with me, it's okay with me. If they save the world, they save millions of lives through their effort, then they will be saved also, their soul. The majority of people are ready for a higher leap into a higher uh, dimension, higher consciousness, higher style of living. The people have to decide to change for themselves. For example, if they change into vegan diet, then even the bad leader will change or he will be replaced. People must think in the right way and listen to themselves because in a way everyone is a country, everyone is a kingdom. If everyone decides to go on the righteous direction, then the energy of the whole world will change. And no matter how bad a leader is, he will change. Being vegetarian, it helps. It lessens our uh, aggressiveness and our blindness, lessen this lower quality. Then this uh, loving quality will come. The more we are in tune with the divine, and the longer of time we are vegetarian, the more we become more sensitive and more connected with all beings in the world, not just animals, but even with trees. I told you sometime before that trees even report to me and tell me that there's some danger for me, and even the trees and the plants will talk to you when necessary, and they, you will feel their love and you will appreciate their beauty more, like you have never seen them before. Suddenly you feel the trees are so beautiful, the animals are so lovely, lovely. This is a rotating list. Please see the next part tomorrow at this time. Welcome, precious viewers, to the conclusion of a two-part series on science and spirituality featuring the fascinating work of Jason Martell. Mr. Martell is one of the world's leading independent researchers and lecturers on ancient but seemingly advanced technologies, as well as early civilizations' interactions with beings or extraterrestrials said to have descended from the skies. He has spent the last 15 years researching this topic through written records, artifacts, and other materials showing evidence of humankind's activities in the distant past. He is the author of Ancient Alien Artifacts, Visual History of Ancient Astronaut Research, and Knowledge Apocalypse, Ancient Astronauts, and the Search for Planet X. In addition, Mr. Martell has appeared on TV channels such as Discovery, Sci-Fi, and the History Channel. We begin with Jason Martell discussing some items that have appeared on the History Channel's program, Ancient Aliens. I'm going to do is focus on a couple of artifacts that have uh, gained a little bit of attention recently. Um, some of them you might have seen, Ancient Aliens. One that I'm working on now is uh, called the Antikythera Mechanism. Sponge divers in 1901 off the island of Antikythera found this device that, when doing radar on it, shows that it has over 72 cogs and wheels. It's more complicated than a modern-day Swiss watch. It's an ancient computer. We don't know who built it down at the bottom of the ocean. It's probably being used for two things. It was an astronomical device, so someone sailing on the seas could use this as a navigation beacon, plotting certain stars. It was also an astrological device so that it can tell you you're born on a certain date and you line up with Jupiter and Mars and so here's some information about you on an astrological level. So it had an astronomical and an astrological purpose. It's a very interesting piece of technology that we don't attribute to ancient man being able to architect something like this. There have been recreated versions of it where it actually does function and all the gears turn and it marks specific pieces of time as the device operates. Uh, it's about 2,000 years old.
ancient Egypt is one of the most impressive civilizations in history. After thousands of years, the Great Pyramids still proudly stand tall today against the azure Egyptian skies, instilling awe and wonder among visitors. One can only imagine the engineering feats involved in its grand architecture. To scientists, these pyramids raise more questions than answers. Another puzzle in Egypt continues to cause debate among researchers. The wall carvings in the Temple of Hathor in Dendera, located several dozen kilometers north of Luxor, depict ancient Egyptians holding what seem to be light bulbs. Did the Egyptian people of the past actually use electrical devices for illumination? Jason Martel has researched this question. Here is a, a, another interesting piece of uh, technology that's found in Dendera, a place in Egypt. These specific wall reliefs show what can be interpreted as an ancient light bulb. It almost looks as if they're holding up some type of large device that has a filament going through it, and you can see it's actually connected to some type of a power source. So throughout Egyptian hieroglyphs, that device is shown in many other instances as being a, a symbol of power. Mainstream science might not accept that the Egyptians had electricity, but the science points to this being possible. Now, modern Egyptologists say that's not a light bulb. The aroma of a flower and that bulb that you see is the, is the aroma of the flower. I question that because of the fact that all these deep recesses and crypts and tombs in Egypt have very intricate wall reliefs, hieroglyphics, carvings, and you would need significant light to do that. Yet there's no evidence of flame or soot on the ceiling from a burning flame. So if they weren't using a torch in ancient Egypt to light these crypts, mainstream science says the only other thing they were doing was using copper mirrors to reflect light. And that doesn't hold up. There's no way that the light can reflect far enough down into some of these crypts. And in this crypt in Dendera, Egypt, it shows them holding light bulbs. And it even explains that Dendera is the light giving source. So if they did have electricity, they're clearly illustrating the, the use of a light bulb to do all their hieroglyphs. Now, if you have the bulb, you're going to need a power source. So it turns out that same epoch of time, 2500 BC roughly, we find something called the Baghdad Battery. There's been about a dozen of these found in ancient Iran. And what they are is just a simple clay pot with a, a copper filling and an iron rod down the center. And if you fill it with any type of weak acidic uh, liquid, vinegar, grape juice, and you put a voltmeter on it, you can actually generate a charge. I brought the Baghdad battery as a replica here. I did a test for that on the History Channel, and it actually did generate four positive volts with just that little cylinder right there. By looking deep into humankind's history, Mr. Martel is shedding new light on our role in the universe. Till this day, Modern science is still unable to provide answers to the mysteries surrounding the creation, purpose, and significance of many giant-sized stone structures scattered around the world. There have been a plethora of different devices and pieces of technology found around the world. I don't know that I can even put a specific number on it because there's different classifications of artifacts and technology. Some of them are in tablet form, some of them are in pictogram form. Some of them are in artifact form. But the ones that I find most interesting are the architectural alignments. Baalbek in Lebanon, uh, Giza, Nazca, Machu Picchu. All over the world, there are these megalithic monuments. And most of them have alignments based on astronomical stars that they line up with. Over time, these repeat, and these, these alignments take place again. How were they able to build such unbelievably large stone edifices that are aligned to astronomical points in time and space? That I think is very intriguing, and I don't think we fully understand how it was able to be done, but it's all around the world. Every culture has these megalithic monuments. Many of the ancient cultures seem to have the ability to quarry and move megalithic sized stones, stones that weigh hundreds of tons. We have no device, no crane, no laser cutting tool today that can lift these megalithic monuments. Some of the megalithic monuments around the world were built in a way that we still can't understand with modern science. Some of these stones have been quarried and taken several miles and stacked perfectly 
and the size of these stones is, is not anything that we can possibly do or replicate today. As an example, in Baalbek in Lebanon, there are these trilithoton stones, stones that weigh hundreds, hundreds of tons, and they're stacked perfectly to form this very large platform. The massive foundation stones of a temple found in the ancient city of Baalbek in eastern Lebanon have bewildered archaeologists for years. These colossal stones, estimated to weigh somewhere between 800 and 1,200 tons, are the largest cut stones known in the world. However, our 21st century machinery would not be able to move the gigantic blocks or stack them. Some legends credit the astonishing megalithic craftsmanship to giants who once roamed the Earth with humans. And ancient astronaut theorists suggest that Baalbek was a landing area or spaceport for extraterrestrial spacecraft. And then over time, other cultures have come and built their cities and civilizations on this platform. But the original purpose of this platform, there are many stories that speak of the gods ascending and descending using this place they called the landing place. It's literally a large landing platform. A lot of the architecture used in these monuments raises a lot of questions. Some of them are so perfectly fit together, almost like a laser, to cut these shapes out of the rocks. They're so finely in precision, and we still can't duplicate this technology today. We asked Jason Martel for his view on how ancient civilizations were introduced to advanced technology. I think it's possible that a lot of the ancient cultures speak of a time when they were visited by beings from the heavens and gave them sacred knowledge. Now again, modern academia says that this is mythology. We have no evidence to say that beings from other worlds came and visited ancient man. But the evidence does exist to say that there was some type of technology given, some type of knowledge given to man. Now, if it wasn't solely from extraterrestrials, it's also very possible that we've lost this knowledge. There's a much larger scale of time that a lot of the ancient cultures were aware of. As we rotate on our axis night and day, there's an astronomical effect there taking a place on us. It's an astronomical uh, effect that affects humanity. The ancients said that there was another cycle of time that will affect us. It's based on the precession of the equinox. That's why we divided the heavens into 12 parts and assigned them zodiacal symbols, because there's a cycle of time repeating on a much larger scale, 24,000 years. Ancient cultures were aware of this and knew that as we go through this cycle of time, we come in and out of heights of technology. So it seems like we're just now starting to rediscover things like the Mayans and various other cultures that built their monuments, alignments with constellations to mark this journey on this 24,000 year cycle of time. And that's just a little bit hard for us to grasp since it's well beyond our current lifespan. Our appreciation, Jason Martel, for taking time from your busy schedule to share your amazing research. May you continue to unravel the many technological secrets of the ancient world and help us better understand our connection with the rest of the universe. For more information on Jason Martel, please visit www.xfacts.com. Books and DVDs by Mr. Martel are available at the same website. Thank you for your company on today's program. Coming up next is Words of Wisdom after Noteworthy News here on Supreme Master Television. May we all strive to bring about a truly peaceful and harmonious planet. For more details, please visit www.suprememastertv.com forward slash SS. or using animal products is like burning your own room while you are in it. Supreme Master Ching Hai 